Hi, I'm Dave Bugney, and this is a short story about gravels. Round-shaped river gravels, like these, are to many species of fish, particularly salmon and steelhead, as twigs and moss are for many species of birds. They're vital nesting materials. Salmon cannot build their reds or nests without it. In this case, these native gravels accumulated behind an old beaver dam just downstream of our place here. And uh, the beaver dam allowed the gravels to accumulate perhaps 60 feet upstream. And it's the largest native gravel placement on our place. And it's been used for reds in the past by both salmon and steelhead. And is a testament to the benefit of beavers as well. Due to decades of wood removal from our creek, as well as removal of trees adjacent to the creek prior to the more rigorous logging stream protection requirements we have today, our creek had lost much of its ability to retain many of its gravels. A significant length of our creek was nothing more than a simplified channel, like you see here, with a scoured bedrock base. And this is just one of the few remaining that we have. Also, from about the 1930s to the 1960s, a portion of our property was the site of a small gravel quarry for the roads in our area, whereby all the gravels, cobbles, and boulders were removed from the creek and the adjacent hillsides to be crushed into road-based materials. With little gravel present, any fish that returned found very little gravel to spawn in. Due to the historic drought that we're currently experiencing, water levels are exceedingly low for this time of year. I've never seen it this low. Fortunately, because of the intact forest canopy we have, water temperatures continue to remain cool. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will be out later on next month to sample some of our coho fry to see how they're doing. From 2014 through 2020, with funding from a variety of sources, we had contractors place over 200 logs with a track hoe and helicopter and over 150 boulders in our creek to mimic what was once naturally here. Our fish habitat restoration work has been done primarily under various Oregon Department of Forestry permits. Usually, about five logs were grouped into engineered log jams and the boulders placed into groups of at least three. These placed logs almost immediately began to function as planned. They retained some native gravels last fall when we videoed a female coho building her red in an area where gravels did not exist previously. With logs and boulders in place to help retain gravels during high water events and to add hydraulic and biological complexity to the stream, the next step was to undertake a gravel augmentation project over a length of about 0.8 miles where the creek flows through our property to more quickly replace some of the gravels that were lost over the past 100 years. About 75 tons of gravel was purchased. With the assistance of our ODFW stream restoration biologist and his department's co-authored restoration recommendations, we chose 19 locations to place gravel pads. Due to the inaccessibility of the creek from our property's road system, for two weeks we, and a group of dedicated volunteers, placed these gravels by a variety of labor-intensive means. The construction of wooden chutes, wooden boardwalks to convey a wheelbarrow, cable suspension systems, and a tractor. This is a brief history of these efforts. The first task was to determine the sizes and amounts of gravels the salmon and steelhead prefer to use, such as shown in this video clip from one of last fall's coho reds dug into the native gravels. Since I could not find any information about this, I decided to do my own research. This past February, after the coho alevins had hatched, developed a fry, and safely left their reds, I removed over 50 pounds of gravels from each of the two coho salmon reds created last November within the creek on our property. I then sifted these samples with a friend's mechanical Rotap sieve shaker and recorded gravel sizes and then put the gravels back. The results are presented in what is called a gradation analysis. This graph revealed a number of interesting things. Each salmon utilized very similar gravels as evidenced by the similar and almost overlapping curves. The average size of the gravels was a little over one and a half inches and most of the gravels ranged in size from about three-eighths of an inch up to about three inches. With these results, I contacted our local quarry to deliver washed, weed-free, round Clackamas River gravels that met these criteria, which I then blended to the proper mass ratios with a front loader tractor. Where access was short, gravel placements were usually done with a series of wood chutes built in sections with some up to 40 feet long. 
We push the gravels down the chutes and then spread them with a shovel. Using this method, over three cubic yards could be placed in a couple of hours. A 64 foot long boardwalk was also used to navigate over large down wood along the bank and then also spread with a shovel. All work was complete by the end of July during our in-water work window when the creek is typically only flowing at about one-tenth of normal winter flows. Where access was long, a cable suspension system with up to a 320-foot reach and a hopper we built was used to convey gravel down into the canyon. One tractor was used to load the hopper. Another was used for the haulback line that controlled the hopper's movement back and forth along the cable, analogous to a skyline yarding system for logs. Gravel pads need a large area for these big fish and to be deep enough to allow them to dig the red and then to be able to cover them properly. This was the most tedious method, and only about 500 pounds of gravels could be moved in the hopper each time. Some placements had to be directed with a sheet of plywood to fit between down logs. Additionally, the water must flow properly through the gravel to oxygenate the eggs laid within the reds. Others required lowering the hopper over 20 feet from the suspension cable above with a chain fall. These deposited gravels were spread with a shovel. Each gravel pad utilized a minimum of one and a half cubic yards of gravel with some over five cubic yards and are spread in the creek to a minimum four inch thickness. Following deposition of the gravels, we placed 12 root wads left over from a logging operation we had conducted in 2014. These root wads, which were added to ones placed in years past, will, among other benefits, provide cover for the fish during their rearing life stage. We identified a wide diversity of gravel pad spots, from narrow, with faster water velocities and greater water depth, to wide, with slower velocities and less water depth. We also located gravel pads within upstream and downstream of large wood structures and boulder constellations and in both shallow and steep stream gradients and at the toes or runouts of pools to try to capture the variety of geomorphological and flow conditions present. When the pads were complete and when necessary, we created a tholoag within each pad or a line of lowest elevation within the creek to allow unrestricted water flow for the smaller fish to move we hope this multi-year effort of wood, boulder, and gravel placements will succeed. If last year is any indication, with over 73 coho reds over the length of about two miles, we're confident it will, and hopefully build upon that success. We will know later this fall for the coho and next winter for the steelhead. It will also be interesting to observe if salmon and steelhead prefer one gravel pad type or location over another. Perhaps in the fall of 2023, these little coho fry, which were hatched this past winter, will be back from the Pacific as adults, bearing the seeds of their future progeny and ready to have some gravel fun. This is Mr. Dave Stewart, our regional fish biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. What are your impressions of the fish habitat restoration work we have done since 2014, from the placements of large wood, boulders, and gravels, to the removal of fish blocking culverts and their replacement with a new bridge and how does this fall into Oregon's salmon recovery goals? You know first of all the wood is still here it's still functioning we haven't yet had a massive flood event which is really going to start to get some things moving and bring in new gravels and that's part of the reason why this second piece of the project where you've added gravel is so important I think it kind of fits into the bigger picture. So that's where I start is, uh, you know, step one, A, we haven't, the projects are, are still functioning, they're working. So from the wood at the very top where we've added wood all the way down to the, the confluence, you know, everything's still here, right? We haven't lost anything yet. So, so that's the other good thing. Um, you know, and then you look at fish use, right? What have we seen for fish use? And it sounds like above we are getting reds. Um, you, you know, the bridge that you fixed that we put in here has been a huge benefit to this project because without it, you have a constricted area that is probably keeping fish downstream, maybe below the best habitat. So all that work we did above, now fish can access because of the fish passage project that, uh, that we completed there. You know, now when I think of long-term on these projects, what is the long-term goal? I think the long-term goal as we look around us is the forest, right? Eventually we're gonna have some of this wood that's naturally being recruited over time. 
and how do we set ourselves selves up for success there? And I think, you know, obviously you um, own a nice chunk of property here uh, that's protected and, and there'll be naturally wood occurring. But, you know, again, working with some of the other residents, the local people, how can we do more of this project? How can we build on to what we've done? And I think that's the educational piece that I think is a really big part of this. You know, you as this local sponsor who's been a champion of really Eagle Creek and the work that we've been doing, I think we need to build on that and bring other landowners in to say, okay, look what we're doing here and here's what we can do on your property. Here's some other stuff we can do. You know, here's an example of a good project that's working. We wish to thank Portland General Electric for providing the funding for the gravel materials and to biohabitats for additional funding to offset some of the equipment rental. We also thank the McMichael, Shibley, Fanslow, Wilmoth, O'Neill, and Kane families for donations of materials and equipment and to the Jenkins, Zercher, Fulop, Fanslow, Kane, O'Neill, and Fountain families for their invaluable volunteer help, dedication to the environment, and strong muscles. My long-term goal has been for Souter Creek to be restored to what it may have looked like 150 years ago, and I believe we're well on our way. Thank you.